Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second May Science Speakers Series this evening at Brian Mitchell Association. I'm Jean Al Gurley, Director of Science and Programs, and I'm so enthusiastic to welcome Dr. Nia Amara from UC Santa Cruz, who is our featured speaker and guest this evening. And just a quick brief bio for Dr. Amara. Dr. Amara is from the San Francisco Bay Area, and she received a BAS in physics and math from Kenyon College and would later become the first African-American woman to earn her PhD in astrophysics from UC Berkeley. She completed her postdoctoral research at Harvard University and is currently a professor of astronomy at UC Santa Cruz, where she investigates how stars are born in the Milky Way and other galaxies throughout the universe. Dr. Marr is also an accomplished artist and astrophysicist whose body of work reflects her love for vibrant color, people, and their stories. Her media includes painting, quilting, and posters. Dr. Marr is also the founder and director of Onakita, a nonprofit that provides free STEM tutoring and other educational resources to underserved youth of color. Her work is grounded in bringing the magic of the universe closer to a wider audience. She accomplishes this, pardon, through her science work, her art, and her community fostering and building. And we welcome enthusiastically Dr. Amara this evening. Welcome, Dr. Amara. Such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. And we appreciate, you know, you making the commitment, especially given the time distance. I'm sure that your schedule is fully saturated. And before I turn it over to you, just one quick note that we would also graciously like to thank our sponsors who make our complimentary science speaker series possible. Our lead sponsor, Bank of America, as well as our alternate sponsor, Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and the White Elephants Hotels and Resorts of Nantucket. And without further ado, I turn the screen as well as all attention over to Dr. Mara. Welcome and thank you again. Thank you again um, so much, Janelle, for the, the beautiful introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Um, are, are you able to see my screen okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for, for having me this afternoon and this evening, depending on where you are. And um, I really appreciate this, this opportunity to share my work. And I'd, I'd really like to thank all of the attendees for taking the time to join me um, and, and hear some of my thoughts about the, the intersection of science and art. I see some familiar names in the, um, in the participants list. And, and so it's wonderful to have um, friends and loved ones and um, new names as well um, that I see. You know, um, in our society today, there are so many people who feel uh, disconnected and, and isolated. In the age of phones and you know, cell phones and social media, it seems that people have never been more desperate for real connection and community. And it's my hope to share some encouragement by reminding folks that we're all interconnected. And that's really a pretty profound idea when you really think about it, because that means that we're responsible for one another. And so today I'd like to explore this idea of interconnectedness through the lenses of science and art. Nowadays, science and art are considered separate things. For most practical purposes, we put science over here and art is something that we place over there, something we expect to experience when we visit the museum or the theater or when we open a novel. Science, meanwhile, can be found in research labs and observatories. And not only do they belong in different places, art and science are often seen as opposed, as requiring completely opposite skill sets and ways of thinking. And it's really rare to have spaces where we can explore the relationship between the two. But it didn't always used to be this way. Before the words science and art took on the distinct meanings they do today, Societies around the world mix the two naturally. I've been asked many times over the years, how do the worlds of art and science connect? And there are many ways to respond to this, but at some point it dawned on me that art and science don't inevitably connect. Science and art don't necessarily come together naturally, not at any rate in today's 
compartmentalized, over-specialized society. Western society has developed in such a way that the default is separation, dichotomy between body and soul, white and black, spiritual and secular, science and art. But such chasms haven't always existed. And for most of human history, cultures around the world practiced a much more organic blend of science and art. And even though we tend to keep art and science at a distance from each other today, this separation is an illusion. Dostoevsky said, for all is like an ocean, all is flowing and blending. A touch in one place sets up movement at the other end of the earth. We can all think of some of the ways that art and science influence each other, but if we go beyond thinking of them as two separate things that occasionally influence each other and we appreciate their interconnectedness, that leads to a deeper understanding of the world and a richer experience of life. My journey with science began with questions, questions about life and relationships, humans' relationships with each other, to nature, and to the spiritual world. I've always been curious about the origin of things, history. I was drawn to physics because I wanted to get answers to those big philosophical questions, questions like, how did we get here? What is humanity's role in the universe? Are we alone? How should we behave toward each other? How should we live? Does free will exist? Does God exist? What's the meaning of life? Physics is the science of nature at a fundamental level. The idea that physics was once called natural philosophy really appealed to me. And rather than just philosophizing about these existential questions, I thought science would be the best way to answer them. But since taking my first college physics classes, I've outgrown the belief that science holds all the answers to these questions, especially those having to do with morality and meaning. Experience has tempered my expectations of what science can do for us, and it's raised my standards for what it should do. So now I ask questions like, how can science be used to serve people? How do we understand and respond to human suffering, especially suffering due to injustice? How do we foster hope? What does true freedom look like? What does it truly mean to love? The answers I've discovered to these questions have mostly come not through science, but through actively seeking to understand people's stories and their beliefs and through art. We are all connected and interconnected. This desire for unity is at the heart of what motivates my science and my art. On a personal level, on a community level and a global level, I'm interested in unity and harmony. At their best, both art and science can be a means to that end. So with that overall framework in mind, the outline of my talk is as follows. I'll begin by telling you a little bit about my astronomy research about my efforts to understand how stars are born. And then I'll continue with some more reflections about the connections between art and science. And I'll end by showing you some of my art and talking a bit about what it means to me. Science is a fundamentally human endeavor that belongs to the heritage of the world. Cultures from around the world and throughout history have contributed to science and to astronomy in particular, which is often considered the oldest science. Long before the telescope was invented and before we had any of the technology we do today, people could look up at the sky and study its patterns. The way that a culture understands its relationship to the stars is very telling. It says a lot about how that culture sees humanity's role in the universe and about our responsibility to each other. This is a 300 year old star chart created by the Skidi Pawnee people, originally from the area we now know as Nebraska. 
The Pawnee and many other cultures believe that we're connected to everything around us, including the stars. And this is entirely true. Modern Western astrophysics tells us that the building blocks for life as we know it were forged billions of years ago inside the heart of stars. If you've ever had the opportunity to look up at a dark star-filled sky, or even if you've only just seen pictures of the Milky Way, it's easy to feel the strong connection we have with the stars. We literally come from the stars, but where do stars come from? When looking at the night sky, it would seem as though all that exists between the stars is darkness, but the space between stars is not empty. It's in this seemingly void dark space that the stories of stars begin. Interstellar space is pervaded by vast dynamic structures that spin tens and hundreds of light years across. Stellar nurseries are invisible to the human eye but if we had radio or infrared eyes, which astronomers do, we would see glowing clouds of gas and stardust that make up the birthplaces of stars. The space between the stars, this is the focus of much of my research as an astronomer. I study stellar nurseries, which represent the earliest stages and the largest scales of star formation well before you ever get to the actual star known to astronomers as molecular clouds because they contain mostly molecular hydrogen gas, stellar nurseries are where stars are born. How stars are born is an important question to astronomers for many reasons. For one, stars illuminate the cosmos, making it possible to study it. When we look at the composition of the universe, we see that the vast majority of stuff out there is in the form of dark matter and dark energy, both of which remain a complete mystery to astronomers. Overall, stars make up only a very small percentage of the cosmic budget, but they play an outsized role in our understanding of the universe, and their formation is relevant to nearly every branch of astrophysics. The properties of galaxies, the detection of exoplanets and their characteristics, the presence of dark matter, the expansion of the universe, all of these can be measured and characterized from starlight. Stars created most of the elements on the periodic table. Their formation naturally leads to the formation of planets with our own star providing the energy that sustains life. So for all of these reasons and more, we would like to understand how stars are born. So how is a star born? Well, before we get right into it, let's take a step back and remind ourselves about the basic properties of light. Light can be thought of as a wave. It literally is a wave, a vibration. The human eye has evolved so that we can only see what's called visible light the colors of the rainbow, but there's far more light than what we can see. Microwaves and radio waves have longer wavelengths and lower energies than what the human eye can see. High energy light waves like X-rays and ultraviolet light have shorter wavelengths, but all of these types of radiation, these are just different names for the different types of light and their, their different energies but all of it is light, all of it is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now it turns out that stellar nurseries, molecular clouds are really cold. They're freezing with temperatures hundreds of degrees below zero on the Fahrenheit scale. And as a result, they give off most of their light at longer wavelengths. And so most of the time we have to use infrared, millimeter and radio telescopes to observe them. All right, so how do we make a star? Although stars give us life and illuminate the universe, the life of a star, ironically, begins in relative darkness. This is, this is an all sky map of the Milky Way from the Gaia Space Observatory, and it's the most detailed map of stars in our galaxy to date. It has measurements for nearly 1.8 billion stars. And this is an image at visible wavelengths uh, that the human eye can see. And immediately obvious are the prominent dark dust lanes that obscure the light from stars. 
But when we look at those longer wavelengths of light, like this radio image, stellar nurseries are no longer opaque, and we see the emergence of thousands of them residing in the Milky Way. And they're brimming with the seeds of new stars and planets. Many stellar nurseries, or molecular clouds, are similar in one way or another to those toward the constellation of Orion. And at less than 1400 light years away, they're among the closest regions of star formation. And this is what one of the Orions looks like up close, made mostly of gas and dust. Stellar nurseries like the Orion B molecular cloud are incredibly cold and very clumpy, with some parts of the cloud having higher concentrations of material than other parts. And you can see these long spider-like tendrils of gas weaving throughout the cloud. These are called filaments. And so here's a cartoon of a filamentary stellar, stellar nursery. And the dark blue represents the filaments and the brighter areas represent compact, dense knots of gas called cores. The cores suck up gas from their surroundings in a process called accretion, they're sort of like these cosmic vacuum cleaners. And as they do, they increase in mass and density. And over millions of years, gravity causes some of the dense cores to compress and collapse under their own weight. And as the density of the gas increases, the temperature at the center of the collapsing region also gets hotter and hotter. Young stellar objects are born rapidly after a molecular cloud forms and energetic processes collectively known as feedback, such as stellar jets and winds, they clear away much of the natal material. And as a region continues to collapse, eventually such a high temperature is reached at the interior that nuclear fusion is ignited. That's the fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium, which generates an outward pressure that counteracts the inward pull of gravity that can stop the contraction. And so now we have equilibrium. And when nuclear fusion starts, the lights are turned on and a star is born. But these graphics, of course, they're not to scale. And so to give you a sense of perspective about how large stellar nurseries are, if we could squeeze a sun-like star down to the size of a blueberry, its host molecular cloud could be the size of our entire planet or even bigger. The Orion Nebula is an actively star-forming region that's part of the much larger Orion A molecular cloud. And so whenever you're looking toward the constellation of Orion just south of Orion's belt, you would be looking toward the Orion Nebula. And as we speak, hundreds of stars are in the process of being born there. And I like to show this, uh, this computer simulation by the StarForge collaboration because it shows how dynamic the star formation process is. The gas is organized into elongated filaments and clumpy structures. And as various subregions compress and collapse due to gravity, they fragment and ultimately determine the mass of the stars to which they give birth. Molecular clouds come in a range of sizes, and many of them contain enough material to form hundreds of thousands of stars. And so this is our big picture in broad brushstrokes of how stars are born. But as it turns out, there are still some key missing puzzle pieces in our picture. And one of those big pieces is how the overall structure of stellar nurseries relates to star formation. Schrodinger, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, said that the task is not so much to see what no one else has seen, but to think what no one else has thought about that which everybody sees. The work I'll be describing now to understand the structure of stellar nurseries stands at the intersection of art and science. And I've been doing my best to think about and look at things in new ways with the goal of understanding how stars are born. These are far infrared images from the Herschel Space Observatory of some of the thousands of stellar nurseries in the Milky Way. Images like these give us an appreciation for how complex and intricate 
the morphology of star forming environments is. In my opinion, molecular clouds are the most beautiful regions in space. Throughout our galaxy, star forming regions are all characterized by filamentary structure. And Herschel showed us that they appear to have some universal properties. Moreover, Herschel focused our attention on the idea that filaments are absolutely necessary for star formation. But here's the problem. Images are inherently flat. Oftentimes we don't have spatial information into the plane of the sky. We don't know what's going on in all three dimensions. But of course, this is the case for much of astronomy. But here, when we're dealing with structures that are much more complicated than spheres like stars and planets, it can become very challenging to interpret what's going on. And if we make simplistic assumptions about the 3D geometry of clouds, this can lead to substantial biases and incorrect interpretations of our measurements. So given the complex structure of molecular clouds, how do we infer the three-dimensional properties of their structure from 2D observations? Inspired by the complexity of star forming environments and the challenges of properly interpreting 2D observations, I wondered, what if we could touch the stars or at least look at them up close? Ultimately, our ability to fully explore information available in observed and even simulated data is limited by the tools we use to represent them. And so I had the idea to use 3D printing as a tool to visualize stellar nurseries and provide new insight about their structure. I wanted to be able to hold the stars in my hand. Astronomers have long been at the cutting edge of data visualization. And compared to some methods of visualization, 3D printing provides the opportunity to represent astrophysical structures in a way that uniquely taps into the human brain's ability to recognize patterns. And moreover, inherently interactive 3D structures can engage our intuition in ways that 2D representation can't. My overarching goal has been to investigate how fundamental physical processes operating in interstellar space shape the structure of stellar nurseries. To, to accomplish this, my collaborators and I ran a suite of computer simulations representing different physical extremes. And these are snapshots of a few of those simulations, which we used as source data for the 3D prints. And this was the first time that um, 3D printing was used in this capacity in astronomy. With telescope observations, we don't have the full, um, I should just say, with telescope observations, we don't have the full 3D information, but with simulations, we do. We know it's going on everywhere and at all times. And so these are what some of the prints look like for their corresponding simulations. Um, the, the spheres are about the size of a softball, and um, greater concentrations of white material represent regions of higher density in stellar nurseries where the stars are most likely to be born while the grayer, darker regions represent low density gas and voids. And for purely aesthetic reasons, uh, we printed the clouds as spheres, but we could have chosen any arbitrary shape. Um, as I mentioned, they're about the size of a softball and that value is determined in part by the resolution of our simulations and the printer. And unfortunately, I can't show them to you in person, but um, these photographs show the stunning effects that you can get when you shine light through the spheres, as well as um, how they appear with reflected light. And if there's any questions about our process, uh, I'd be happy to address those during Q&A. Uh, we also printed half spheres so we could see just how dramatically the structure changes throughout a molecular cloud. One of the biggest surprises for my collaborators and I was that the morphology of clouds is even more complex than we had thought. In traditional images, much of the structure is projected. Uh, it's all compressed onto one plane. But with our prints up close, we can see just how continuous the substructure is. And we're noticing features that don't necessarily stand out in flat images. I think of these spheres as maps or globes that help us to see and interpret structure in new ways. 
And if anyone is interested um, during the q and I would also be happy to talk about how our findings stand up to observations and what the implications are. And I would also, um, as I mentioned, be happy to, to talk about the process that we use to make these prints. Art and science sometimes come together in unexpected subconscious ways. I once drew a sketch of myself holding a star in my hand. And several years later, I had the idea to 3D print stellar nurseries. This seems to me to be one of those perfect instances of life imitating art. Art and science are expressions of human creativity. To be creative means to connect and our ability to make connections is enhanced when we realize that everything is interconnected. So going back to that earlier question, how do the worlds of art and science intersect? I've already said that in today's society, there usually isn't much common ground in practice. On the other hand, there's another way to answer this question. What art and science have in common is the human being that holds both of those things within them. In other words, the ways in which art and science are interconnected are fluid and depend on the uniqueness of each individual. For example, I think of painter Alma Thomas, who was inspired by nature and space. I think of the mutual inspiration between astrophysicist Margaret Geller and Jasper Johns, Geller was asking the simple question, what's the structure of the cosmos? And she set out to map the, the nearby universe. And this is what that map looks like from, from those early data. Jasper Johns transformed the astrophysicist's pioneering map of the distribution of galaxies in the universe into a work of art. I think of George Washington Carver, who's known as having been a genius of a scientist, but he was also the consummate artist. Carver was born into slavery. From childhood, he had a deep love for the beauty of the natural world and always felt a profound spiritual connection with nature. Though he was persuaded to pursue botany in college, Carver's first love was art and he painted throughout his life. And he even created paints from peanuts and used those in his own artwork. He didn't recognize any divide between science and art, and neither did he see any contradiction between science and faith. Above all, Carver was interested in using his creative power to serve humanity. His motivation for his many innovations that ultimately transformed American agriculture was to raise the standard of living of poor black farmers. Understanding that many of the people he wanted to reach were illiterate, he used his talent as an artist to communicate his ideas visually. And I think of Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian writer who wrote short stories about the natural sciences and considered his pedagogical work for the peasantry his most important writing. For artists and scientists such as these, the fence doesn't exist. Art and science intersected within each of them in ways as singular as their personalities and their cultures. In our fragmented society, though the default is separation, art and science are in reality interconnected. As Tolstoy expressed it, science and art are as closely bound together as the lungs and the heart, so that if one organ is vitiated, the other cannot act rightly. And beyond the level of individuals, art and science have the capacity to connect on a societal, cultural level. One of my favorite examples of the marrying of art and science is the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and the only one to still exist. The Egyptian pharaohs believed they would become gods after they died, and they had their people construct magnificent tombs to house the treasures and various amenities they would need in the afterlife. The Great Pyramid was built 4,500 years ago for Pharaoh Khufu, 
It was the first and largest of the pyramids that would eventually be erected at Giza. The base of the monument is a near perfect square with each side stretching 756 feet, which is the length of a 50 story building and aligning almost exactly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Narrow passageways tunneling from interior chambers to the surface appear to point towards stars that were important to the Egyptians. One of these shafts pointed to the former North Star, Thuban, the point about which all the heavens appear to turn. I say former North Star because 5,000 years ago, the North Star was Thuban, but due to the slow wobble of our planet as it spins, a phenomenon called precession, Earth's axis gradually changes where it points in the sky over the millennia. Today, the North Star is Polaris, and more than 10,000 years from now, Vega will inherit the title of North Star. To conceive such a phenomenal vision and execute it required a sophisticated understanding of physics, math, engineering, astronomy, architecture, and art. The foundations of all of this knowledge had to have been laid centuries earlier in Africa. Science and art were a means to an end. They worked hand in hand to connect the living and the dead, the material world with the spiritual. I like to think of the space surrounding art and science as a spectrum, not a linear spectrum, but one that curves, twists, and wraps back around upon itself like the merging colors of a soap bubble. At one place in the spectrum, art is weighted toward emotion and feeling, at another spot on the spectrum, science is weighted toward logical understanding. The scientist approaches the universe in a manner that, it's, uh, that stresses logic. She's concerned with the, the quantifiable. She looks for physical evidence to support her theories. The artist approaches nature in a way that emphasizes personal meaning and expression. She's sensitive to emotional proof and spiritual proof. But these connections and approaches are dynamic and interacting and they're not exclusive to either discipline. The spectrum metaphor allows us to see some of the many similarities in the ways artists and scientists approach things. Both artists and scientists value beauty. Their work requires creativity, curiosity, critical thinking, technical skill, and imagination. For both art and science, the joy of discovery is one of the common rewards. The spectrum metaphor also shows that art and science are interdependent. Art doesn't exist without science. The tools needed to make art, paint, paper, musical instruments, are the results of the application of scientific knowledge. And science doesn't exist without art. Sometimes it's harder to see how because art's influence comes in the elusive form of in inspiration oftentimes, which is indirect and impossible to quantify. Art can help us to see the world in new ways, shift our perspective and literally change our thinking. One of my favorite painters is Alma Thomas. She created a series of, of paintings called uh, Space Paintings, which included this piece here called The Eclipse. She was a master in the use of color and in abstracting the patterns she saw in nature. Thomas was inspired by the music of nature. She had pieces with names like Red Roses Cantata and White Daisies Rhapsody. And like many Black artists, Alma Thomas was concerned about racism and injustice, though this didn't necessarily come across in her art in any obvious way. She once said, through color, I have sought to concentrate on beauty and happiness rather than on man's inhumanity to man. And in 1972, at the age of 81, Alma Thomas became the first Black woman to receive a solo exhibit at the Whitney Museum in New York. Both art and science, when they're effective, involve the art of storytelling. As astronomers, we try to tell the story of the history of the cosmos, of its origin and evolution. And in doing so, we're building on the knowledge of the many generations of scientists who came before us. 
As an artist, I'm very interested in other artists who intentionally set their work in a broader historical context. Artists like Sanford Biggers, who draws from uniquely African-American aspects of quilt making. And Carrie James Marshall, who is widely considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest living painter. And Micheline Thomas, her 2010 painting, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Les Trois Femmes Noires, is a direct reference to Edouard Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, painted more than a century before. This is Manet's painting, Luncheon on the Grass. Picasso also created some 40 variations of this classic of the Western canon. Manet's painting, in turn, was inspired by Le Concert Champêtre, the pastoral concert by Titian, as well as another definitive work of the early 16th century, The Judgment of Paris, an engraving designed by Raphael. Like Manet before her, Thomas takes an old motif and breaking with past tradition makes it her own. And in pointing back through several centuries of art history and weaving it with her personal history, Thomas asserts that black art and black women are part of the lineage of Western art. What's more, she sets an old idea and into, an, into an entirely new cultural context and thereby breathes new meaning into old forms. And I'm very interested in how my people in this country have, have used art to define themselves and rewrite the narrative on how they're viewed in a racist society, especially Black women. Sojourner Truth was a former slave who escaped and became one of the most prominent abolitionists of the day. She gave her famous Ain't I a Woman speech just a decade after the daguerreotype was invented. By the 1850s, photos were being mass produced and people, um, they took what were called um, carte de visite, these, these pretty cheaply made photographs that they could leave at their, their friend's house, uh, sort of the, the Instagram of the 1850s. And Sojourner Truth during this time was probably the most photographed black woman of the time, but her portraits were, were carefully staged works of art and they had a real practical purpose. She sold them to earn a living and fund her abolitionist efforts. She said, I sell the shadow to support the substance. I take a lot of inspiration from Sojourner Truth and George Washington Carver. I want my art and science to serve a purpose. In 2020, I founded a nonprofit organization called Onakita that provides free STEM tutoring and other resources for black and brown children. Onakita is unique for a few reasons. First, we offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring at no cost. And this is a service that many of our families might not otherwise be able to afford. And um, frankly, I believe should be, should be free for everyone. Secondly, our tutors are extremely talented black and brown scientists from among the top universities in the country. And this is really important for representation. About 80% of public school teachers in America are white, and many of our students may have never had a science teacher who looks like them. So when they interact with our tutors, they see what's possible. Thirdly, we also have a mentoring component that's equally as important as the tutoring component. This is a recent event, a uh, community event, where we were giving away free books to, to children in the community. Most of our students are in the sixth through 12th grade, and our program is growing. We now offer scholarships and other free resources. And um, you know, if you wanna support our work, please do, do check out our website. I began Onikita with the recognition that far too many of our young people have been and continue to be neglected in this educational system. And so my hope is to, uh, that our organization is making a difference in children's lives and to empower everyone who comes into contact with our program to make a difference in their part of the world. I like this quotation by the legendary Mae Jemison. She says, the difference between science and the arts is not that they are different sides of the same coin even, or even different parts of the same continuum, but rather 
they are manifestations of the same thing. The arts and sciences are avatars of human creativity. Both my science and art are very people-centered. Most of my art focuses on people and it takes no direct inspiration from astronomy. That said, one of the things that links them are my love of light and color. Astronomy is the science of light and images. Astronomers are experts at decoding light and we understand that color is light. In painting, I love the use of bright, unexpected colors and, and playing with light. And this painting and most of all the following pieces are mine. Almost all of my paintings are oil on canvas. Uh, I rarely situate people in a clear physical setting. Um, they're often treated sort of like still lives where, where all of the focus is on them. And in the rare case that I do put somebody in a landscape such as this piece called Nerland, the landscape is imagined or fantastical. My inspiration comes from all sorts of places, including nature, books, and other artists, artists from around the world. This is a painting by the great Japanese artist Hokusai, and I put my own spin on this piece by placing a girl at the center and incorporating her with the waterfall. I have a series of stylistically similar pieces that I call meditation series. And in these pieces, um, there's a lot of symbolism that is personally very meaningful to me and some of the work that I've been involved in over the years. Many of my portraits are of people that I've imagined And I've also done a number of portraits of real people that I admire greatly, people like artist Clementine Hunter. I've done many self-portraits. And I'm very fond of painting children. When I started college, around the time I was taking uh, my first college physics courses, I had the sincere but ultimately naive belief that science held the solutions to humanity's biggest questions and problems. Science definitely plays a role in, in solving those problems, but today I'm more drawn to science because it deepens my sense of the mystery of the universe and because the lessons we learn from nature can aid our social and spiritual development. Through science, I've cultivated a deeper awareness of how the natural parallels the spiritual. As for art, I'm drawn to it because it puts me into direct contact with myself and with others. For me, science is the search from the outside in, while art is the search from the inside out. In different ways, both science and art have helped me to understand that we're all interconnected. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Nia. <laughs> that was so much.